So, for much of its history, Japan has been relatively isolated from the rest of the world, um, partially because of the fact that it is this island chain archipelago that is geographically isolated from the mainland China, Asia, Korea, etc. Um, but also for a period of about 850 or it's around 650 years, Japan actually isolated itself politically as well. It basically did not let anybody else into the country except for the Dutch. They actually created a little Dutch city and the Dutch people were not allowed to go out of that city. And that was the only interaction with the outside world that Greater Japan had um, for a very long time. Even when the Mongols were trying to invade in the 1200s and 1300s, they could not get across um, the Sea of Japan right here because of the kamikaze or divine winds. They destroyed all the ships. So the local religion of Japan is Shintoism, which is basically this umbrella term to describe these beliefs in natural spirits and nature. So oftentimes when you go to Japan, you'll see little huts on the side of the roads. Those are intended to be like little god houses. So there's also the idea of Zen Buddhism, which arrived from China around 1100 CE. So Zen Buddhism is a derivative of Chan Buddhism, which is basically this belief that meditation and contemplation will lead to enlightenment. So meditation, manifests as many different forms in Japanese art, usually through things like Zen gardens or particular activities like tea ceremonies, ikebana, which is basically flower arrangement, as well as bonsai growing. So there's a lot of themes that are frequently recurring in Zen Buddhism. Those include things like loyalty, endurance, and austerity. So oftentimes you'll see very muted color palettes. Things are very calm and serene. You can imagine that if something is really busy, it's not going to be very meditative or contemplative. Additionally, we're seeing a lot of similarities to China in terms of who practices the arts. So there are artisans that are passing their businesses and expertise down family lines, but there's also members of nobility that are contributing to the arts, not only financially, but artistically. Um, just like we're seeing in China, calligraphy is an extremely important art form. China is also influencing Japan in terms of materials and art subjects. This includes things like landscape painting. We'll get into exactly what kinds of landscape um, art are being presented in Japan. Um, we're also seeing a couple of historical narratives, images of nature, and so forth. So some of the art forms that we will be seeing um, include ink paintings, narrative scrolls, woodblock prints. We'll also be seeing some things associated with Zen Buddhism and the practice of Zen, um, including palaces, tea gardens, and tea houses. All right, so we're moving on to our first artwork of the Japan unit. So this piece is called Night Attack on Sanjo Palace. Um, this narrative scroll is read from right to left. Um, and the idea of these scrolls is that only a small portion is viewable at once. So when you look at the bottom right hand part of the screen right here, this is basically a um, the entire um, scroll that's been rolled out and I've had to separate it into two sections so that I could fit it on the slide. So this is the very end of the narrative right here. It starts here and then it goes this way and then picks up over here again and goes this way. So the narrative is slowly unfurled. So it's sometimes difficult for us to envision exactly what it would have been like in its original context to hold a small portion and, un and to unfurl it as we go along. However, when we do look at this narrative as a whole, we notice a couple of things. I'll scroll forward into the beginning portions of the narrative. So what you'll notice like in this close-up right here is that there's little, this little carriage right here. And this carriage is represented twice in the same image. So this exemplifies the idea that this is a continuous narrative. A continuous narrative is when a character appears multiple times in the same 
narrative sequence and there aren't any divisions present. So those divisions you would imagine are like how on a comic book page you'll see the character several times but you know that there's not two of them because there's divisions that are separating the parts of the narrative. So a continuous narrative is basically showing the same um, kind of like the entire story in one long continuous image. So this is an example of emaki, or narrative scroll painting. Um, and this particular image was painted around 100 years after the night attack on Sanjo Palace actually occurred. So as you're probably familiar with, if anybody's ever seen the YouTube video, A History of Japan, um, Japanese history is extremely complicated. There's lots of very complicated rivalries between groups, there's constant shifts in government, but basically what you need to know is that there was a coup that was staged by rebels and then the emperor at the time was taken hostage and that his palace was burned down. So when you go to the earliest part of the narrative right here, the emperor is in this ox-driven carriage and he's being led through the scene as this palace is burned down. So this is at the gate of the palace right here. You can see them storming the front gate. And then you can see the climax of the story right here in these undulating waves of fire, these very crowded masses of figures right here, people storming out of the gate of this enclosed space right here, and then this lone archer and horseman fleeing um, as they escape the narrative. And you can see that the emperor's carriage is still there. So the rebels are basically coming into the palace, storming it, burning it down, and killing basically everybody that opposes them. So if you actually look at um, kind of like the smaller elements of this piece, you can see these rebels right here carrying these poor dudes' heads on pikes. So the figures, by and large, are pretty depersonalized, especially when you look at this from a kind of like greater perspective when it's all rolled out. Um, the facial features are, again, relatively simplified, but there are a couple of noticeable things when we're looking more specifically at the individuals in this work. Um, there's a lot of kind of like miniature narratives that are all happening simultaneously in this very frantic, complicated, multi-leveled image. So there's a dying archer right here. You can see the that the artist has flicked on a splatter of red paint to indicate the action of this blood spurting. You can see that the horse is in has been ha, is rearing in midair. These rebels right here have pretty hairy faces, whereas the nobles' faces that you can notice that their features are a lot softer. There's also this interesting detail on the left-hand side of these concubines. So these are basically courtesans that are weighed down by their robes as they're trying to escape the fray of this battle. And of course, they're not getting too far because their robes are so heavy. So scrolls like this were really emblematic of the kind of chaos and conflict and turmoil that was happening during this time period in Japan. It was not long after this time period that there was a, an era of relative stability. We'll talk about that shortly, this period of stability that was brought upon by the introduction of Buddhism and kind of like its establishment as a major religion in Japan. So, let's see. I've walked you through the narrative. Here we are. All right, moving on to our next work, White and Red Plum Blossoms. So, the major thing that I want you to remember for this piece is Rinpa, this term right here. So, Rinpa is a style of painting that was named after one of its founders, Ogata Korin. So, Rin, Rinpa. So these paintings are usually pretty recognizable. They almost always have a gold background. They use very bold colors, stuff that stands out. Sometimes you'll often see the colors clashing as well. They're very noticeable. Um, and oftentimes these images are separated into sections so that they can be used as folding screens. So a lot of these artworks are actually decorative in nature as well.
Another thing that you see commonly in Grimpa painting is this juxtaposition of naturalism and abstraction. You'll notice like when you look at the the plum tree right here that you can see these little growths of lichens and mosses on the tree. And they're quite irregular. This is what lichens look like when they grow on trees. But when you look at this water feature in the middle of this set of screens, you see these almost oil-like undulations in the water. This is not a texture that you would typically see in water. So this is this interesting juxtaposition of more naturalized imagery, something that would have probably be, been done from life. You can even see that too in like the, the variety of the the, the sizes and shapes of the buds on these trees right here. And then you have that juxtaposing with this more, this artifact of basically the human imagination rather than an observation of nature. So the style of Rinpa was also influenced by Yamatoe, which is basically um, a style that was popular, popularized um, based on Chinese paintings that were done during the Tang Dynasty. It's considered a classic Japanese painting style. It focuses on these very undulating, flowing compositions, mostly of secular imagery. You won't see deities or spirits or gods on images like this. They're mostly natural imagery, lots of mountains and lots of water features. One thing that you'll also notice and probably remember from one of our previous units is this golden background. So it's a very flat, but at the same time, a very um, kind of like limitless space. We saw this in Byzantine mosaics, as well as the works of Gustav Klimt. So Gustav Klimt was actually heavily inspired by Rinpa style painting. And when you go back and look at his works, you can see that influence very clearly. So in terms of juxtaposition, we're also seeing um, a contrast in terms of things that are still and things that are flowing and undulating. We also have this very high and close vantage point. These screens are about five and a half feet tall, which is quite a bit taller than the average Japanese person at this point in time. So this was intended to be something that was around life size. It was immersive. It was something that would have basically been intended to transport you to a different place, so to speak. So here are a couple of examples of other Rinpa style paintings. You'll notice that again, a lot of them are cordoned off into sections because they were used as folding screens. Um, here is an image right here that um, is very similar to the one that we saw in the previous slide. We can see these, se these same wave-like undulations in the water and this repetitive natural imagery with gold backgrounds. All right, you're probably all familiar with this work under the wave off Kanagawa, also referred to as the Great Wave. It's one of the, I believe, three AP artworks that we have that have an emoji. So this piece is by Katsushika Hokusai. Um, this is actually one of 36 prints from the series that he created called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. So this term polychrome right here is referencing the fact that this is a woodblock print that's made with many colors. So a lot of early woodblock prints would oftentimes just use black and white. So they would um, roll black ink onto a woodcarved surface and then print that onto paper. So an image like this actually requires several carved plates. You're applying ink onto them and then you're pressing the images on top of each other to create this composite image where you're having all of the colors go together. So this is an example of ukiyo-e, which is another style that we're seeing um, emerging out of Edo period Japan. So ukiyo-e is basically an image of a fl the floating world. Um, they're very famous prints associated with Japan. So the floating world is kind of an ambiguous term, but in this case, it's this notion of life being a very transient thing. It's passing, there's a moment in time, and then it's gone forever. So nature really only started being a part of ukiyo-e printmaking after Hokusai started ha exerting a lot more influence. A lot of ukiyo-e style printmaking will feature individuals from kabuki theater. You'll see these very crowded, lively festivals. You'll see images of geisha, um, images of women working in brothels. 
um, a lot of times printmaking was used to advertise different services that were offered in these sprawling cities. So you would see a lot of these themes in Ukiyo-e. So, but again, Hokusai was really among the first to explore landscape as a theme in woodblock prints as like a dominating factor. Additionally, Hokusai's prints were some of the first works to disseminate out of Japan into the Western world. So you'll recall our Impressionists and Post-Impressionists from a couple of months ago, artists like Monet and Mary Cassatt that are referencing Ukiyo-e in the subject matter of their works as well as their methodology. So remember that Mary Cassatt was using printmaking methods and using this more linear style with these blocked colors to create her artwork, whereas Monet was focused again on this more like transient nature of the modern world, um, man and nature kind of coexisting. There's also this notion of like the impermanence of city life. There is a snapshot in time. These people will never be in this exact position ever again. There's also a lot of these very layered flat spaces. So we have like one ground right here. This is the background. And then we have this wave, which is kind of in the mid ground right here. And then this white cap right here, which is in the foreground. So Mount Fuji in the background blends in almost seamlessly with the waves. It's really a genius compositional element that Hokusai has employed here. He's also put this white cap right here to kind of add this element of repetition into the piece. So we have this white cap right here and then sometimes our mind passes over Mount Fuji in the background. We don't even notice it. So Mount Fuji has a a uh, very spiritual significance to the Japanese and has done so for thousands of years. Um, it's become a national symbol. Um, it is viewable from the city of Edo, which is now Tokyo. And of course, it is the focal point of the 36 views of Mount Fuji um, that is presented in this series by Hokusai. Another thing I want you to notice in this piece is how the artist is injecting imagery into these waves, how he's created the splatter of the the white caps coming off of the surface. Again, it's this moment in time. You can see these little claw-like projections on the water. It's this very scary, imposing image. It's overwhelming, especially when paired with the individuals that are crouching in fear in these little boats. You can see them kind of like ducking their heads um, hoping against all odds that this wave is not going to capsize their boat. So there's really a, a notion of the sublime that is present here that you could use to compare to works that we, for example, saw in the Romanticism unit. So keep that in mind. So I wanted to give you a couple of other examples of images from the 36 views of Mount Fuji. Thankfully, Wikipedia has some really nice high quality images of these prints. One thing I want you to notice when you're looking at these images is that they're compositionally very different in a lot of cases. Um, when we look at our previous slide right here, Mount Fuji is pretty central in the composition. It's, it's more or less in the center, but it's very small and we almost don't notice it. But when we look at other images, we are seeing varying levels of prominence. In this image, it's basically this diagonal line that is framing the piece right here. And this one, it's outlined in red, which is making it very obvious. And you can see these little hatch marks on the bottom left-hand corner. And these are little trees that are conveying the scale of this massive mountain. And then in other images, we're seeing a more anthropocentric or human-centered composition. Um, in these lower images, for example, we have a couple of people inside of a house and then Mount Fuji is just this little peak in the background. In this image, again, Mount Fuji is very central and it's been pigmented using this very deep blue. So it's really standing out in the center of this image and it's almost framed by these other elements in the work. So these are really interesting pieces in terms of exploring how composition affects how we perceive different elements of content in artwork. There's a great video here um, that talks about the process of woodblock printmaking, um, especially if you've never done it before, I highly recommend watching it. It is on the um, Google Slides version of this presentation and I'll let you go through it on your own time.